Good morning. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving celebration with your friends and with your loved ones. And we truly have so much to be thankful for. Be able to be worshiping the Lord together. And our song set this morning focuses on the God who is eternal and who has existed even before time was even created. And so I'd like to read a passage for you all from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, which is a vision that Daniel had. And it talks about both God being called the Ancient of Days, so one who has always existed, and Jesus being referred to as the Son of Man, emphasizing his humanity and the things that he, uh, his human aspects that uh, we can relate to and he can relate to us. And so if you're able, would you please stand as I read God's word? This is Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I kept looking at the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And we have an amazing glimpse in this vision that Daniel had of things to come and a picture of heaven, you might even say, where Jesus is there before God Almighty. And really the result is praise and worship. And so as we gather together as God's people and as a church family, may this be a glimpse of heaven for us as well that we can uplift God's name, that we might praise him because he's the one that has always ex existed and has always been faithful to each and every one of us. And so let's consider this as we open this time in prayer and worship together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that before we were even born, you knew us and you had a perfect plan for us. While we were yet in our mother's womb, you fearfully and wonderfully made us. And you know, all of our life, past, present, and even what's to come. And because you're sovereign, you're in control, we ask that we might yield to you our very life, that you would be in control. Help us to allow you to be the captain of our ship, that even when the storms of life come and things are chaotic and we don't even feel like we know what's coming, help us to trust in you. Help us to declare that you are the one that knows better than we that you are the king on high. And so may we respond with submission, help us to bow down before you, or I offer up our, our very lives to you, the ancient of days, the one who has always been and the one who is yet to come. And so we thank you that we have a savior that understands everything that we've gone through, all of our struggles, all of our temptations, and yet he was perfect. And that through him, we might have new life. And so thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. May we respond with true worship. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So the nations rage. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. Though I will not feel, for this truth remains that my God is. Well, 
Oh 
Christ we know wherever we are we ask not for ourselves but for your renown the cross has saved us so we pray your kingdom come let your kingdom come let your will be done so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Give us your strength, O oh God, and courage to speak. Perform your wondrous to those who are we, Lord, use us as you want, whatever the test, my grace will preach your gospel till our dying breath, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth, till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your
You may all be seated. Pastor Steve. This morning, we're going to take a look from the 27th chapter of Acts. We're going to ask the question, have you ever been in a crisis situation and you didn't know what to do? You're sitting in a hospital ward, someone's dying, and a family member, and you wish you could do something, but there's not much you can do, and everybody's panicking. There's something that you can do. Maybe you're in a, a work situation where there's been massive layoffs, there's economic downturn. How can you be a leader at work even though you're not the boss? What about a situation where we are seeing the moral crisis in our country just sink in our state and our local areas? How can we be a Christian testimony when we see a moral crisis? Today, we're going to talk about a crisis and how to demonstrate a witnessing leadership during a crisis. Maybe you're going through a family crisis, a health crisis, a work crisis, even a ministry crisis. And there are things that we can do through leadership. And leadership isn't having a title. Leadership is influence. Leadership is being able to have a spiritual influence on the world, uh, on our company, at our school. There's been this situation a couple of years ago when we transitioned a new director that I'm a board member of uh, from uh, the former director. And some of the problems that uh, we had to deal with, they were hidden in our former administration but boy, they came to light when the new administration came on. And for the first six months, I was getting tons of phone calls and uh, from, the, from the new director. And, uh, and when things would happen, it goes to the administration and then it goes to HR and then it comes to me. And there was a joke around the office that said, uh, we better call Steve. And we know, we know what that <laughs> meant. And I don't know if you ever got those phone calls where it's kind of like, oh, no, you know, what is it now? And it was it was just coming pretty much off the hook and dealing with crisis situations. I'm so glad that lasted about six months. It's been good for about the last year. And uh, even the director just joked and said, I haven't had to give you those calls lately. <laughs> Thank the Lord. But but ministry Bad things happen. You know why? Because we're dealing with sin and people sin. We're dealing with tragedy. We're dealing with death. We're dealing with uh, uh, people who don't get along. And we're trying to resolve and reconcile difficult relationships. That's what we do. And so every week there's a crisis. There's something to be managed because there's a problem to be solved. And that's just the ministry. But yet, you have it at your school. You have it in your home. There's relationship crisis. And how can we have an impact? We're going to take a look at the Apostle Paul in a very unusual text of Scripture, Acts 27, which is an account of a shipwreck. It's good to see some of you got off the ship safely, but we're going to talk about those who didn't. And how Paul used that situation to be an inspiring leader. So we see that the Apostle Paul was committed to going to Rome. He, we see this two years ago. He was really desiring to go to Rome. And in Acts 23, 11, Jesus talks to Paul and says, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify also in Rome. So Paul used the whole idea. He could have been free, but he wanted to stay a prisoner to make his appeal to Caesar because he knew that 
he can use that platform to be a witness to Caesar and to be a witness in Rome. So as a prisoner, he was going to be shipped to Rome. And so, um, so we see here that he's starting right over here in Caesarea Maritime, just above Jerusalem. That's a starting point. He's going to go to Sidon. Then he's going to, not the Poseidon, but that was another adventure. Okay, anyway, that's an old movie, Poseidon Adventure. And then, uh, then he's going to go to Lycia and then to Crete, where um, if you're with Crete, then that's concrete. And then he ends up in, uh, in Malta because he wanted a good chocolate Malta. And so, so, so those are just some of the locations that he's going to end up going. And during this chapter, there's all kinds of nautical problems. Now, it's really written in a rich nautical language because it's written by Luke. And Luke has been on enough ships to know how to talk like sailors talk. Right? Have you been in a, on enough airplane? You, you know how to talk the airplane language. and uh, But he knew how to talk the ship language. And we're going to look at 14 ways that Paul didn't have to be the boss, but he exerted spiritual leadership and influence in his commitment to the Great Commission. Right? And so he was no halfway. He was all the way in. But I want you to see how he did it by observing the Apostle Paul's life. So the first thing that we see here is that he would gain the trust of authorities and adversaries as much as possible. We live in a world where there's a lot of unbelievers, and we need to get along with them. We're not to be those problem-making Christians. I remember when, um, when all our girls went to public school, my wife and I made the decision that we were going to be the teacher's helpers. I would be a principal's helper sometimes. And, and we wanted them to know we were on their side. We wanted to help them. We didn't want to be one of those parents or one of those Christian parents. You know, that would be a pain in their neck. We, we wanted to just show them the love of Christ. And we, we wanted to be a help in our community. And so so basically, I'm not saying compromise, but don't be a jerk. That, that's, that's really what's necessary. And look how it, it worked in the life of the Apostle Paul. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. All right, He was kind of uh, from the family of Oompa Loompa, so we call him an orange Julius. If you try to give him the shake. And embarking in a ship of a dramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. Now, we read about Aristarchus before being a companion of Paul, Saul. And, um, uh, and Paul was also with somebody who said, we, who, who is writing we here? That's Luke. So Luke and Aristarchus are Paul's companions. The other prisoners on the ship, they didn't get to have companions. There were a lot of other prisoners on this ship who were being shipped to Rome basically to be lion food. They were going to end up in the Colosseum defenseless, or they would be trained as gladiators. And, uh, you know, who put the glad in the gladiators? Uh, well, you know, Paul was there to put the glad in the gladiators. And so, so here they, these prisoners, they, they were gonna, they, they were very low ranking, but Paul was a prisoner of rank. He was a, making an appeal to Caesar. And so he got to have two companions, uh, Sir William Ramsey, who wrote a, a, a history on the, the life of Paul over 100 years ago. He, he believes that Aristarchus and Luke, Dr. Luke, uh, were, were categorized as Paul's slaves. So they were able to accompany Paul. They weren't really his slaves, but under that status, Paul had the privilege of having that accompaniment. And so that, that was really cool. And then we, we see the next day we put in at Sidon and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And so as they were traveling to Sidon, you know, it's kind of like they're at the port of call, you know, and, uh, and Julius the centurion 
the Augustan centurion, he lets Paul, Aristarchus, and Luke go free. And they went to Sidon to visit a church that was planted in Acts chapter 11. Oh, was it Acts chapter 11? Uh, but anyway, it was, um, um, yeah, it was Acts chapter eleven nineteen 19, where we see the church of Sidon founded. So he goes to visit the church. And then guess what? He didn't try to run. He comes back to the ship. That's how trusted he was. So here, Paul was a prisoner who had a great relationship with the Roman centurion, Julius. And it's important to have these types of relationships. You know, what we deal with the secular community, with the uh, police department all the time. And, you know, we want to have a good relationship with them. You know, because we're working together for the good of the city. They may not be believers. And when I function as a police chaplain, I am not to proselyte. Right? I follow those rules. But we have a ministry of presence where we are there. We can be an encouragement. And then they can come and ask us about our faith whenever they want. But we are there building relationships, redemptive relationships. And, uh, and that's what's beautiful when Peter talks about in chapter 2, verse 12, of First Peter, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of your visitation. Right? It's important to have a good testimony among unbelievers. When we uh, take a look and examine missionaries to, to send out, one of the, you know how you have references? You get a reference from a pastor, from a friend, from a, a coworker. We also get references from somebody in their life who's not a believer. Because we want to see what kind of, relationship they have with unbelievers that's that's very very important especially you can be a missionary and we're all missionaries we need to have a good relationship even with those who might be adversarial or an authority and paul did that and julius was very favorable to him secondly expect plans to be thwarted we have dreams we have visions not not like you know, uh, dream type visions, but, but, you know, we, we have a vision of what we want to happen. We have a purpose and they don't always plan out. Right? I have visions for ministry. They don't always plan out. God has uh, uh, something else in store. You might have an educational path that gets thwarted. You might have an occupational path that hits bumps in the road and Maybe you wanted to go this way, and you ended up this way. I mean, I wanted to be a piano player for Earth, Wind, and Fire, and I ended up in the ministry. You know, I mean, I'm glad for it, but, you know, I wonder what if I was a musician. And, and, uh, and, and so, so we, plans get thwarted. And putting out to sea, where we sailed under the Lee of Cyprus. Now, it's interesting. You're going to see the nautical term Lee used here. Lee does not mean... Uh, uh, your Chinese name, or it doesn't mean left or right, east or west, you know, like starboard or port side or, or east or west. What it means is it's um, if the strong wind is coming and it's hitting the island, like on the north side, the, the leeward side would be uh, the, the, the south side of the island. It's kind of like um, yesterday, I, I used the church oven to, uh, to, to bake a turkey. And there's a huge wind that comes out of the oven. I mean, well, you know, a huge fan. And so I took the turkey, I took the inside part of the turkey, you know, with a hole in it, and then I put that towards the fan. So the top part where the wings were, that would be like the lee side or the leeward side of that wind. So, so it would be sailing, when you're sailing on the leeward side, you're sailing on the protected side. Instead of that strong wind, it's been muted somewhat by, by the island of Crete. And, uh, and then you're, you're somewhat protected, or Cyprus. So here they were tra tra sailing under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There we found, there the centurion, Julius, found the ship of Alexandria. Now where's Alexandria? Which country? Egypt, right? So, so Alexandria is in Egypt. That's important when I talk a little bit about uh, archaeology in, in a little bit. So, so note, they found a new ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. 
This is a grain ship. This is covering, uh, this is transporting grain to Italy. So Julius finds this ship. So it's not a, a prisoner ship. It's not a, a war ship. It's a cargo ship. These ships typically were 140 feet long, 36 feet wide, and about 33 feet deep. And it would hold 276 passengers plus the wheat grain. I mean, that's that's pretty cramped in. This is for a two-month journey on the crazy, wild Mediterranean Sea. And so here they were on this particular ship. And uh, and this, so the centurion found the ship in Alexandria, sailing for Italy, put us on board. And we sailed for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Critus, as the wind did not allow us to go farther. We sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmone, and so coasting along it was with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. All right, so all of that to say is that they had plans and it didn't go as well. Right? It's, it's like my travel last week and the, the poor college kids traveling today by plane. Right? Who knows what they're going to face? Like I was trying to fly over to Grand Rapids, and I got stuck at San Francisco because the the fuel gates didn't work, so they had to put a dipstick in there. That delayed me an hour, so I missed my connection in Denver. And then when I was flying out of Grand Rapids, we had 12 inches of snow, and uh, I had one hour to, to, to run from my, my gate in Phoenix to catch a plane home. It took an hour to de-ice the plane, and then it took a half hour to plow the runway. So I ended up missing my connection, and a wonderful pastor in Phoenix took me in, picked me up, and took me in his home. And drove me to the airport the next day. But, you know, plans get thwarted. And you you have this career path. You have this educational path. You have these hopes and dreams. And then someone gets this bad diagnosis. And you're wondering how you're going to handle these types of things. And Or, or you thought your company was going to be so successful. And now they're having massive layoffs. Our, our plans get thwarted. And we just need to be prepared for that. Right? In church where we deal with sin and things that go wrong. You know, at, don't, don't expect things at church to be just smooth sailing because it, it, it just doesn't. It isn't. Number three. Warn of potential dangers as much as others will listen. Okay? We can warn. We can warn lovingly. We can warn patiently. Uh, but, uh, but also, no, not everybody's going to listen. Not everybody's going to listen to the gospel, but we need to give the gospel. We need to warn that there's judgment for sin, that there's an eternity of hell, but yet there's the gracious salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. We need to give that hope, but we also need to tell them what people are saved from, and people don't always want to hear it, particularly in this immoral, amoral climate. But we warn, as much as others will listen. So since much time passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, because even the fast was already over. Now, what is the fast? The fast is referring to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And so the Day of Atonement was a holy fasting day for the Jews. So it was known that after this particular fast, the time to sail in the Mediterranean was not good unless your ship was built for typhoon-type storms. This is a grain ship, not built for those kind of storms. So that's why it talks about that fast already being over. They know that between September 14th and November 11th, during that two-month period, the, the, the skies were overcast, so you couldn't navigate because they didn't have all those cool equipments. You know, when I was landing in Grand Rapids last week, it was like like fog on clouds all the way down and snow. And then uh, and I, I'm just looking out the window. And the next thing I see is the runway. And I just said, boy, that's <laughs> what a great pilot and great instruments. You know, I mean, he can make that. I, how do you find this airport? You know, I mean, I, I could see nothing for, for miles and miles and miles. And, uh, you know, and he landed there. So but back in the old days, they had to use the 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 sky for navigation and they couldn't do that in this particular climate and then the waves were just super super dangerous 
So Paul advises them saying, Sir, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. So Paul gives a warning. But guess what? He's overruled. Because who's on the ship? The centurion, Julius, he paid more attention to the pilot, right? The captain of the ship. Now, could you blame him? Right? He's the captain of the ship. He sails the Mediterranean. He knows the water. But who else is on the ship? The owner. The owner of the ship from Alexandria. He was on the ship. And so, so, uh, so the centurion obviously would listen more to them than he would listen to the Apostle Paul. So we warn as much as others will listen. He wasn't out there saying, oh, you better listen to me and just start whining and complaining and griping. He warned, and he left it at that. Number four. Remember that majority rule is not as good as divine guidance. Majority rule. right? And, uh, and so a, a lot of times uh, people will have this, you know, oh, somebody's dying. Oh, well, most people think that they shouldn't know that they're dying. And, uh, you know, well, a minority says, well, I think they should know. Right. And, uh, oh, no, you know, it, it, it's that old kind of cultural uh, thing. You know, Do we let them die in ignorance and bliss or, you know, do we let them know so they know how to deal with it and prepare? Right? And so so there, there can be this debate on which one do we choose? Now, what we need to do is to assert divine guidance. What does the scripture say? Because that's more important than the majority. The majority is not always right. You see these elections. Right? They're not, majority's not always right. And we just have to remember that. And that, sure, the majority might speak, but we have this underlying sense of confidence and steadfastness in the revelation of God. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix a harbor of Crete facing from southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. So where they were, Paul said, we should stop here and it'll be safe. Everybody else is thinking we can risk it because Phoenix off of Crete, I mean, uh, I mean the, the shawarma is really good there in Crete. Right? I mean, where we are, eh, you know, but if we if we spend um, because you're thinking the next two months, where are they going to stay the next two months? If they want to stay in Crete, they want to stay in this port of Phoenix in the harbor of Crete because that was the happening place. So they wanted to risk it. That might have been the majority decision. That doesn't mean it's the best decision. Number five. We also need to prioritize by discarding what weighs you down. When you go through a crisis, you don't have time to deal with all of the extravagance. You don't have to, time to deal with all the froth and the foam and uh, the, the, the fuzz, right? We, we need to deal with what is essential at that moment. And when you're on a ship, sometimes that means getting rid of the Watson and Jetson. You know, or you, you need to just get rid of some of the stuff that you just don't knee that's weighing you down. And so when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and they sailed along Crete close to shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the nor'easter, the northeaster. So this is interesting. This term is a combination of a Greek and Latin term. It's a combination of, uh, uh, they called it the Euroquilo. Euro, Euros is uh, the term for East and um, and Aquilo is Latin for Northeast. So here are these two terms combined for this intensive force. So this so they had a, a, a calm wind and they were sailing along, sailing takes me way to where I want to be. Right. And so so they're they're sailing, but then in verse fourteen, a tempestuous northeaster strikes down from the land. And when the ship was caught, they could not face the wind. 
And so we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Kata, right? So they're, they're kind of on the other side of the island from uh, against where that wind is. We managed to, uh, with difficulty, to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they use their support to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, the tiny ship was tossed, and if it was not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. So they began the next day to jettison the cargo. So they got rid of all that extra stuff. We need to focus our ship on what's important, which is the people. Get rid of all the junk that's weighing it down. And they even threw over the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all the hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. So they couldn't navigate and they couldn't go the direction they needed. They couldn't tack, you know, which is to, uh, to go in and out of the wind. So Hebrews tells us to get rid of the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us so that we can run the race with victory and with faith and with endurance. And so it's not, you know, if you're going to go, you're going to go race a mile, you're not going to wear the heavy coat. You know, I mean, swimmers have those big, giant, heavy coats. You're not going to wear that into the water when you're racing, right? And so, so you take all of the extra stuff off and just focus on what is essential instead of the things that weigh us down. Because in a time of crisis, what really matters, right? When somebody's dying, you don't care about the college game yesterday. You don't care about even the Warriors, right? I mean, as much as we love the Warriors, we care about the person's eternal security. We care about family. And we care about friends. We throw everything else aside because that's what matters at that time. Number six, you don't need to have a position to have a voice of leadership. You don't need to have a position. What you need to have is influence. That's leadership. What you need to have in leadership is an opportunity that you can serve. For example, when the police are on scene and they call me, I don't interfere and tell them what to do, right? But they give me a lane that I can be a spiritual leader in, uh, in, in a tragedy or in a death scene or, or in, in just some chaos that's going on in the city and they need help. My, uh, my friend, Paul Sager, who was the, the last general director of biblical ministry worldwide, he wrote a, a book called Leadership, Lessons from an African Village. And he grew up as a missionary kid, and his parents were uh, missionaries in Nigeria, and so uh, so ministering to the tribes there. So he, he shares lessons from the tribes on this book called, on, called Leadership. It's a great book. And, it's, uh, and one of his chapters is about the medicine man, because... The tribe has a chief who has the title as the boss of the chief, but who really has the influence? It's the witch doctor, not the chief. Who do the people go to when their kid is sick? The witch doctor, right? When there's this big problem that's brewing, they go to the witch doctor because they want that solved. The witch doctor doesn't have a title, doesn't have an authoritative place in the government, but is the one who people go to. Right? There's witch doctors at the church that don't have a title but have influence. All right? this is, that's a good thing. All right? There are people who uh, at work may not have a title, but they're the influential people. There's people at your school. They're still students, but they're influential at school without a title. Right? So that's kind of that witch doctor principle. And this is what the Apostle Paul was doing and having a voice without having a position. I mean, he's a prisoner. Since they should be without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. So what we need to do in that situation, we need to look around and see what needs to be done. 
I'll give you an example. Um, uh, when we do a wedding and we have the rehearsal the day before or sometimes two days before, but we have the rehearsal, I, I will go in there and and I, I don't want to be bossy. So I, I go there and then I say, well, let's see, who wants to lead the uh, the rehearsal? Now, if it's the venue uh, coordinator, you know, I'll, I'll see, do they want to do that or do they want me to do that? And then I'll just supplement where it needs. I remember there was this one venue that people were getting married at for a while. And then uh, there was this one wedding coordinator who's really difficult to deal with. And, um, you know, some of you might remember because you got married there. And, and, uh, and so she was really tough on brides and grooms, but she really liked pastors. So, so you know, so I, I would have to say, okay, I know what I have to do. So when there was something that she wasn't listening to the bride and groom in, then I would have to step in on behalf of the bride and groom and say, this needs to be done. And so here, you know, you're just kind of seeing, okay, who's going to leave and then where can we fit in? So you're in this crisis situation at work. You may not have a position, but you're saying, what needs to be done? Who needs encouragement? Who needs some help? Who needs some support here? Who needs a reference? Who needs a connection? Uh, or you're, you're, you're sitting around in the hospital and it, you know there's nothing that medically can be done. But you can look around and just say, oh, well, so-and-so needs encouragement. So-and-so needs encouragement. Oh, so, so-and-so needs food. How can I go run and get somebody some help there? Right? So you don't have to have the title. You don't have to be the doctor. You don't have to be the administrator. You can be somebody there and show leadership by taking the initiative to make some needs, meet some needs. And that's what Paul did. You don't have to have a position to have a voice in leadership. Number seven, be a voice of encouragement and hope. Twice Paul is saying, take heart. Yet now I urge you, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. Now it's amazing because God told him that. Nobody's going to lose a life. So take heart. There are 275 people who need encouraging on that ship. And Paul is encouraging them. He says twice, take heart. Sometimes people just need a, a, a word of encouragement, a word of strength. We can do that. How you doing? How can I pray for you? How can I help you at this difficult time? You know, I'm, I'm here to listen. Just go ahead, pour it out. Uh, I'll sit here as long as it takes. And, and so sometimes we, and, and then we can say, you know, this verse encouraged me, where we can be strong, where we can trust in the Lord with all our heart. And so uh, we can give a little bit of encouragement there. And then number eight, give assurances from God's word. Give assurances from God's word. I mean, why was Paul able to say there's going to be no loss of life? For that very for this very night, there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. So this God, to whom I'm his son and whom I worship, he sent a messenger angel to me. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men. I have faith in God that it will be as exactly as I have been told. Now, we may not have angels talking to us and saying, nobody's going to die. But Paul did. What we have is the word of God. And what we can give is the assurance of the word of God. Number nine, don't hide the harsh reality. Don't hide the harsh reality. You know, don't say, oh, they're, they're not going to die. We can't promise that. Oh, you know, you're going to. You know, you'll be able to keep your job. This company will survive. You know, your investments will pay off. You can't promise that. Oh, your dreams will come true. All you have to do is believe. Only Disney could promise that, but we can't. Right? And, uh, and, and, and that only works for princesses, too. Paul said, we must run aground on some island. We're going to crash. Right? We're going to live, but we're going to crash. And so you need to be prepared for that. Right. And that's why we give you those warnings before you fly. You know, we, you, you listen to the, you know, the oxygen tank's going to drop on to you before your kid and uh, the life vest is underneath. Know where your exits are, you know, and, and so we, we get all these things. I, 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 I'm also, a San Francisco airport chap, right? 
I've never been called, but, but we do these drills every year. And so a couple of months ago, I was doing this drill and, you know, they pretended somebody came in and, you know, was, was, was rough to people on the airplane. And so, so here we have the fire department, police department, sheriff, ambulance, uh, the airline workers. And then we come in as uh, airline chaplains. We're, we're working with the Red Cross just to see what assistance we can give to the victims' families and to the victims. And so, uh, uh, so we, you know, and we do this year after year. And I'm actually kind of getting a little tired of the the same over dramatization by these quote unquote actors. You know, getting really serious about their script and just all right, got to deal with these guys again. You know, but but you know what? It's good practice because one day it just it just might happen. We need to be prepared for that harsh reality. So there will be a crash landing, but maybe we can have our own Netflix series called Crash Landing on Christ. Don't hide the harsh reality. Number 10, tell the truth, even when it's inconvenient and unpopular. So the 14th night comes, we're being driven along the Adriatic Sea. About midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding in about 20 fathoms. A little farther, they sounded again, 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run into the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for that day to come. Now, pay attention to the anchors. And the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. So what does that mean? The sailors were trying to figure out how to sneak and get away from that sinking ship. And everybody that drowned and died, except the sailors. But Paul said to the centurions and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. So they ended up listening to Paul. They wanted to save their lives. They probably didn't like what Paul was saying, but Paul told them an inconvenient truth. Now, what's really cool, when we talk about the anchors that were dropped um, in 1985, I believe, they believe they found the anchors to the Acts 27 ship. Right? And so uh, they, they found this not, not too far from... Uh, uh, what they call St. Paul's Bay but, uh, in Malta, where there's, uh, where, 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 and so these, these lead made anchors were found at about 118 feet uh, 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 in uh, 2005, it was, in the Selena Bay. They're on display at the Malta Maritime Museum. And inscribed on it, if, if you can see here, it's ISIS. And on the other side of the anchor, it's um, it's Serapis. Those are Egyptian deities that they pray for. Remember, it's an Egyptian grain ship. And so it had Egyptian anchors. And so it's possible that these were the anchors from uh, from from Acts 27. Uh, and at least they think they are. This is this is a replica of what the anchor would look like at that maritime museum. So so this is kind of a modern replica of what, what these anchors were. And so, uh, uh, but but anyway, the, the point is, we need to tell the truth, even when it's unpopular. The gospel is not popular, but we need to tell it. Number 11, look out for everybody's needs. Look out for everybody's needs. It was about dawn. Paul urged him to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have continued to suspense and without food. All right, it's been 14 tumultuous days. You haven't eaten. Now, I don't know why they didn't eat. Some think they were seasick. Too seasick to eat for 14 days. Uh, you know, no, who's going to cook when you're going through all these waves? Also, or uh, I Howard Marshall thinks that they, some of the sailors were fasting during this time. So he says, you continued in this without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of you. You haven't eaten in two weeks. Let's eat. You're going to live. He's looking out for everybody's needs. Last night after our uh, wonderful Thanksgiving meal at, at, uh, at Bree and Chris's house, we brought home a bunch of food. And the first thing my wife does is she started calling people in the church and saying, hey, we got some food. Can I bring it over to you? I'll bring it over to you right now. She's looking, you know, she's looking for, for people's needs. And, you know, why do we eat so much? I mean, this is, we, we want to feed people. We're looking out for people's needs. Number 12. Give thanks 
that Christ is present. Give thanks. I know sometimes we're so afraid to pray in public, even for our meal. But Paul did it in front of 275 people. And when he said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Does this language sound oddly familiar? Breaking bread after praying? You know what? What he is also doing is he is, he is symbolically demonstrating the presence of Christ in that bread, like communion. But he's giving thanks before those 275 folks. So they cast off the rudders, leave them in the sea, uh, and, the, and they cast off the anchors, leave them in the sea. They, uh, they tighten up the rudders with ropes. They're hoisting the foresail to the wind so that they can make it to the beach. So they, they're, they're saying, okay, we're going to make a run for it. It's better to crash on the beach than to die out here in, in the sea, in the, in, the, in the Mediterranean Sea. But striking a reef, they rammed the vessel aground, and the bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. That's the next point. A crash landing is still a landing. You might land hard, but man, everybody lives. We'll take that. We'll take that. But a crash landing is still a, a landing. And then the last point here. Saving everyone is better than eliminating threats. Right? God's, in the, God's in the game of saving people. But the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest they swim away and escape. And you can understand from a Roman soldier perspective, if they lost a prisoner, they could be executed. So they're that they were going to die if they lost prisoners. So they were going to kill the prisoners rather than let them escape. Unless they swim away and escape. But the centurion, Julius, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first, make them land, and then the rest on planks on his pieces of the ship. All right, so here they were swimming on planks. You know, Rose is saying to Leo, you get off, there's not enough room for you. But everybody else, nah, yeah, that was the Titanic reference. But you know, but here they, they were on planks swimming on the pieces of the ship to the shore so that all were brought to safe, safety to, on the land. And so, uh, so you know, the goal is we're trying to save everybody. We're not trying to eliminate those who threaten us. Let me get rid of those people in my life. Get rid of those people in my life because they're inconvenient or they're a threat or, uh, to me. Now, our, our goal is saving everyone. So as we wrap it up, I think First Peter, oh, well, this is, uh, this is where they think the crash may have happened, and that's at St. Paul's Bay. Um, they're not really sure. There's debates, and there's different sites. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting read on that. But as we, uh, as we wrap things up, First Peter chapter 3 tells us when facing a crisis, don't fear or be troubled. Right? We can... We can have that calm as Paul did during the storms of our life, during your storm that you're going through, the health storm, the family tumult storm, the uh, the work storm, the um, you know the ministry storm. First Peter three fourteen: If you suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. And that was Paul's anchor in the storm of his life. Secondly, be ready. Be ready to give a reason for your hope. If we honor Christ the Lord as holy, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I, I mean, think of the follow-up conversations Paul was having with those 275 passengers, including the soldiers, including Julius, about why he was able to have hope and give hope to all of that ship. That's an opportunity for evangelism that comes just by leadership in crisis. And then third, keep a good testimony before the world to be effective in the world. And so have a good conscience so that when we're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So keep our lives ready to be to not be smudged for somebody to say, oh, why should we listen to you when, when your life is so unlike Christ? Why should I believe in Christ if you don't even live up to it? 
right? So, so we need to keep that good testimony to be effective in the world. So during a time of crisis, God will give us peace and God will use us to be a blessing to others. There was another ship that didn't move. There was another ship in 1873 called the SS Via du Havre, which was the most luxurious ship afloat sailing to New York, November 1873. You'll see a name there. Spafford was the writer of the song. Mrs. Spafford and the four children, Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie, were set setting sail on this ship. Dad, Mr. Spafford, couldn't make the voyage because he lost a great deal of property uh, in the Great Chicago Fire. So he was tending to that, and he would meet up with them in a couple of weeks. At 2 a.m., another iron English vessel rams into the Ville du Havre, and, uh, and in two hours, the ship sinks. Remember, there were 276 on Paul's ship. On this ship, 226 die, including the four Spafford children. Nine days later, Mrs. Spafford uh, lands in Wales and cables her husband two words, saved alone. She's the only one. Later, they take the boat and they're over this area where the Du Havre is beneath them. And Spafford penned these words. Let's stand and let's sing them now. And if I can help Get help advancing the slides, thank you. Mm -hmm. When Second as the last. Though Satan shall mock it, the trial should come. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you that we can have peace amidst the storms as Paul did because Christ is the anchor of our soul, because Christ is our Savior of sin and death, because He died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Father, thank you that in Christ we're saved, saved from the storm, saved from sin, saved from death because of our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Jordan and our elders to please come up here as we uh, are going to, please be seated. We're going to uh, take a few moments to pray for Jordan. Jordan is uh, going to be starting a ministry position at the Church of the Highlands in San Bruno. And uh, and we're very excited for him. We uh we wish he was serving here. We feel like the Boston Celtics giving the uh, championship ring to the Warriors. 
but uh, but but we know we're really one team in the the grand uh, in kingdom uh, scheme, and we're really proud of Jordan. Jordan has served here well. He is, uh, I mean, he was born here, and uh, and he has he has served uh, us in so many wonderful ways. His his sermons are amazing, and uh, and his uh, his the the way that he will. Uh, look at people who will come into the youth group or into the church and spend time and befriend them. Uh, it shows the heart of one who really loves the flock. And so I'm really proud of him. I had hoped to one day be his assistant. Maybe that'll be true one day. I don't know. But but uh, but I am so proud and just think the highest of, of Jordan. And in Acts 13, the church of Antioch sent off their best, Paul and Barnabas. And, and we could see it that way, that we are sending one of our best off to do another ministry at another church. And so let's pray as the elders lay hands on today. Our precious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the way that you have led and the way that you have prepared Jordan for pastoral ministry. Father, I want to thank you for the godly examples that he has had in his home to show him the heart of ministry. Father, thank you even for uh, the sponsors and the youth leaders and the people who input into his lives and Western Seminary. And, and uh, we are just so grateful for uh, all that has gone in. Thank you for the way that he has blessed us from his teaching to his music, to his encouragement and his ability to, to make us laugh even during the hardest of times. And Father, I pray that as we release him to serve you in another ministry, Father, that you will give him such great opportunities that he will be humble. He will, he will draw upon the power of the Spirit of God, and he will be able to stand on your word to take him through the great things that you have in store for him. And so, Father, use him in the most powerful ways and thank you that he's close enough that we can still pray for him, hear from him, have a meal with him, and to encourage him as he encourages us. We thank you for our brother Jordan. Use him greatly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We just have a few announcements today. Uh, this afternoon, Step by Step is meeting here. At Fellowship Bible Church, Fellowship Hall, the guys will be having a prayer time. Tomorrow, 10 a.m., Young at Heart will be meeting. Uh, Pastor Steve will be leading the Young at Heart, and it's both here as well as on Zoom. Uh, we have a new ministry starting in two weeks, December 8th. Alan and Margaret are heading up a caregiver support group. And so if you're caring for elderly or you're caring for those uh, in late stage of their life, and you just need support, um, this is the, the ministry for you. We know a lot of you are caring for your elderly family members. I know uh, when my uh, father died or was uh, aging in 2018, it was really wonderful to have people just to talk to, to get advice and guidance. And so uh, Fellowship Bible Church is starting up this new ministry. Uh, if you're interested, please join. They are meeting on Zoom. Um, in uh, December's rolling around, Christmas is coming. Our Christmas program is going to be December 18th. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, please sign up. We just need to get a count for our Christmas breakfast. Right now, there are 12 families uh, or 12 people, 12 families. Uh, so uh, we want you all to sign up. We want to get a good count, uh, but we're excited. Please invite visitors as well, uh, December 18th. Um, last but not least, uh, thank, thank you for all who give. Uh, we've actually changed up and upgraded our financial systems and uh, we'll be distributing the receipts uh, for all of your giving from the year digitally via email. If you haven't done so already, please register your email so that uh, our treasurer, Alan, can get that out to you. And to close us out, we want to lift up uh, Dongza and Ho Ching uh, Thong family. They are ministering in Northeast India. Uh, it's a very diverse area and a couple of uh, uh, prayer requests. One is they're expecting their fourth child 
please pray for Ho Ching as she is obviously dealing with being pregnant and um, she's a bit weak right now. Um, also just pray for her strength and also continuing to care for her family. Uh, the kids are in a period of transition. They're testing for admissions into school. Um, please pray for them and pray for the selection committee that they would just be blessed to find the right school for their kids. Um, Dongza is actually doing both preaching as well as writing a book and doing some translation. So please pray for him as he preaches through Leviticus. And then Dongza's mom is in ill health. She can't speak and having difficult sleeping at night. So please pray for them. Why don't we uh, pray right now and close in prayer. Father, we are grateful that uh, FBC is a place that can support missionaries and even send out workers to the field. We're so grateful, Father, for Jordan and the exciting uh, plans that you have for him and this community. We are not far from him, and we get to continue to fellowship and hear about wonderful things that you're doing in his life. Strengthen him, bless him, guide him as he continues to minister and do good works that you've laid out ahead for him. Father, we want to pray for Ho Ching and Dongza and the challenges that face them as well. Father, we pray for their new family member that's coming. Give great strength and health to Ho Ching. Father, we pray for uh, Dongza's ministry to that community. Father, for his preaching as well as his uh, book writing and the translation work that's ahead of him. We especially want to lift up Ho, uh, Dongza's mom and her health and her salvation. Lord, uh, strengthen them, uh, especially this season. Father, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for our place in this community. Father, how you have called us here, how you have uh, reminded us how important it is to be mindful of the community and how we are here to ultimately reach those who don't know you. Thank you for this Christmas season as we begin uh, the new month of December. Father, may we use uh, even the upcoming Christmas program to bring those who don't know you to come and hear your word and to come and know Jesus. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Pastor Steve's message in the word. Father, bless our week and bless our afternoon in your son's name. Amen.